I'd like to start by asking Amir about you know, how you came to, to make the film, because I know it's been years in the making, what the idea was and, and, uh, and what you're trying to say with the film. What's the, 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 both the sort of political idea and the artistic idea? Um, how I came to do it was because I was on the demonstration. And so the artistic idea, well, f first of all, it, it was, um, you know, when I was on the demonstration, I was in Berlin, and I was trying to decide whether to stay in Berlin or come back home to, to London. I stayed in Berlin. When I came back to London and my friends told me how big it was, I really felt sort of sad that I'd missed something big, and I didn't know why it bothered me. It was really cold on the day, by the way. It That's was. Why <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was freezing in London, and, uh, in Berlin, and it was, it was the first, it was really my first political act. It was the first demonstration I'd been on. The idea didn't occur to me until I'd come back to London and learned how big it was. And then I sort of, you know, started researching it and seeing that it was sort of, you know, global. And then I, and a couple of years later, I just had a light bulb moment when I thought, well, that's a hell of a story. Just, uh, just as a filmmaker in terms of telling a story, if someone had told me before that, you know, uh, years ago, the biggest demonstration in history happened, I'd be curious to know, well, tell me about it. Who organized it? Where did it happen? What was it for? But I had lived through it. And so it struck me that that was a story worth telling. And that's what I set out to do. No more and no less than telling the story of a day which, you know, it, it didn't work. Um, it, I, that's what I thought at the time, too. And I thought, okay, it was a heroic failure, but, but, but nonetheless, a really interesting story. And I didn't know where it would take me. I didn't know who'd organized it. I didn't know anything about it other than I have to find out. I don't know what compelled me, but I did, and of course, I had no idea it would take me nine years, and I don't really care. But um, and actually, it is because it's taken that long that we have the film that we have. Because, well, thank God, because otherwise you wouldn't have had those points at the end about what what happened next. Quite, and I suppose yeah. the lesson I've learned from that is that you know, making you know these kinds of films about this kind of issue and this kind of story takes time. It's not about a light. It's not about a sort of moment when you switch a light on. You know, um, so so that's really. How it, how it came about, and because it took time, um, I was able to see it all you know, play out. And of course, the narrative that you hear most of the time is, you know, yes, there was that demonstration, it failed, there's nothing else to talk about, and I hope the film shows that that's not how these things work. And how was it funded? I mean, what, how, was, that, was it crowdfunded, basically? Is it going to be available in cinemas, or is, that, um, or is it only kind of mm -hmm. for limited circulation? Right. No, it was. I had absolutely no money. I personally have remortgaged my home three times over this period just to be able to live. To be, to be able to, we got no institutional funding. Nobody gave us any money whatsoever. Uh, I mean, well, no, no, no BBC, no Channel 4, no um, BFI. I mean, you know, in the end, it became an equal opportunity thing. I wanted to give everybody an equal opportunity to turn us down. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in the end, so what happened was in 2011, after four or five years of researching it, I did a Kickstarter campaign. We got our initial funding, seed funding, and from, with, with that, I set off. I mean, with, with 50,000 pounds, I set off, hoping and praying we'd raise the rest of the money. And, you know, Omid Jalili, um, heard about it, you know, I was at school with him, I hadn't seen him for years, he said, right, really love this, I'll match what you raise, and then it was a domino effect to the point that we, you know, it took between 2011 and just a few months ago when we finished the film, just different people hearing about it coming on board and giving us the money. We're still short of various amounts of money, we need to pay bills, but still, the fact is it's here, it's in the cinemas, and on the 21st of May, this Thursday, it's going to be in 90 cinemas in 45 cities around the country, Every cinema chain is involved, so the Cine Worlds and Odeons and Views and Picture Houses and Curzons and independent cinemas, 22 of them in London. Uh, so I say that only to say that it will be widely available, but it, the week-long release on the 22nd is going to be in a smaller number of cinemas. If the, react, if the audience has come on the 21st and the, re, and the response is good, we hope that maybe the cinemas will then give us longer releases around the country. Uh, but uh, yeah, so hopefully it'll, it'll be widely visible. You mentioned that uh, when you started out, you didn't know who organized the demonstration. So uh, we have one of the people who organized the, the February dem 2003 demonstration here today from the Stop the War Coalition, John Rees. And, and as, as I think came, became clear in the film, Stop the War Coalition predated 2003. It started immediately after the 9-11 attacks and the build-up to the war in Afghanistan, and it continued and it continues to this day with, with a very effective campaign across the 
country. And of course, there were many, many big demonstrations after 2003, and it had many offshoots in the form, for example, of military families against the war, the student protests, uh, the school student protests, we're hopefully going to hear about a little bit again in the future. But, but maybe, John, you could tell us a little bit about, A, you know, how the, the thing came to start. You know, why was it February the 15th, which I still didn't quite get from the, uh, how, the how was that date chosen, and what you, you felt from seeing the film now about the 12, um, 13 years since and how it's played out? Well, the, the, the short answer to the, um, to, the, uh, to the question about why was it February the 15th is because we were at um, the, um, the big anti-capitalist demonstration in Florence and you saw the, the film there of the, of the, of the mass assembly in a, in a disused rail station in, in Florence where, where that call was first made. That was um, preceded by a, a, a meeting, quite a small meeting actually, if my memory serves me right, I think there were about 30 people there representing different European global um, anti-war anti -war movements. Um, I think a couple of days before, just as the, uh, as the, as the Florence uh, anti-capitalist demonstration um, was, was beginning, and we argued about the date. Some people were arguing it should be later on in March. Um, myself and Chris Nynam, who you see um, on the platform there, uh, and Lindsay German from the Stop the War Coalition argued, no, that the military buildup was happening very quickly, that there was a huge head of steam now building, that we had to call that demonstration earlier. And, and we settled on the end of, uh, in, uh, on the date of February uh, the 15th. That was then a little bit later uh, mirrored by a call from the uh, Akaro anti-war conference. And there are, there are still people in Cairo who believe that they made that call first. And I, I never try to disabuse them of that. Um, uh, and, that uh, and that's how we came to that, that date. Um, my, my sense really watching it now um, is this really, that... Um, it gives you uh, an historical sense about something that you were a participant in. And I think that's very important. You see, it, it, when, the, when the debate is raised, as it often is, and it's raised quite rightly in the film, about uh, was it a failure, did it work? There are so many movements that you can ask this question of, especially in their immediate time frame. If you ask about the Toll Puddle Martyrs at the time, did they win or did they lose? At the time, they lost rather badly and, uh, and with far worse, worse personal consequences than we did. They were all transported off to Australia for their pains. If you ask the question about the suffragette movement, actually its best days were before the First World War and the vote wasn't granted until 1928 uh, to women in this country. So what I think it should give you and what it gives me is a historical sense of the time scale and the societal impact of a movement of that scale. I must admit, I, I, I understand why people, especially if they were on their first demonstration, thought that that would be enough. I, I never did. I thought that we would have to get beyond that. We would have to get to a serious level of industrial action, which we did call for. Uh, I thought there would have to be a, a widespread social reaction, which in part the school students did provide on the day that war, that war broke out. But we got to the limit of what was possible at that time, and the limit of what was possible at that time did then um, if you like, ripple out through the years and have more profound effects on a longer term scale than we could possibly have thought we were doing on that day, I think. You mentioned uh, the school students and, uh, and Catherine Connolly's from, who was part of that movement at the time, which is quite an extraordinary thing here in Britain to have school students going on strike. Uh, in support of the anti-war movement and the, and the struggle against the war. Maybe, I mean, Catherine, if you could say a little bit about, you know, how that came about and what your experience was and how it's reflected in the film. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I suppose the school student strikes that happened came about precisely because of the kind of huge demonstrations and the huge mass movement that was created that, that we've just seen. And that's the very important context. I think without that, school students wouldn't have had the, the confidence to do that. There was this growing sense that we were in the majority, we were um, on, on the side of what was morally right. Um, and so I think that, that gave us the confidence to, to even consider um, taking action like that. Um, the way that it came about, there were two school student strikes before the Iraq war. Well, there was one before, 
Um, and essentially, school students up and down the country were getting involved in the Stop the War Coalition, were joining the protests. And uh, this was really important because at the time, um, there was this kind of real discourse from the government about young people, and it's changed now. Now young people are a problem because they're too political um, and they demonstrate too much. But back in like 2001, 2002, um, the discourse went that young people were apathetic. It's what everybody said, you got sick of hearing it all the time. Young people are just selfish or apathetic. They don't care about anything. Um, they're so apolitical. Um, what a rubbish generation. Um, and. I think, you know, lots of young people knew that wasn't true about us. We just were turned off by what was going on in Parliament, the, the politics of self-interest that just didn't, didn't speak to us. And I think what we showed is that our generation, far from being apathetic and not caring about things, um, were some of the most principled, idealistic people who, who did want to see real change, who did want, have a real appetite to participate in politics. And so... We got involved in the Stop the War Coalition um, in, in huge numbers, and that was becoming evident. And there were so many little subgroups set up in, in Stop the War. There was, you know, at one point there was things like Skaters Against the War, and it was like all these like, millions of different groups. So we got involved in setting up School Students Against the War, and we were thinking about what we could do, and we had big conferences, we had national conferences, um, where hundreds of school students would get together. Was that just in London, or was that nationally? Um, well, they were usually held in London, but no, students but came from... Yeah, the walkouts happened all across the country. I was in Cambridge, um, that's where I was at school, and we went to these big national meetings, we talked about what we could do, um, and we had a meeting where we all, at the end, got up and said what we were going to do in our college. Um, my fr Everybody kept saying they were going to go on strike and they'd already made plans. Um, we didn't know that. And what happened to you as a result of the walkouts? So, um, as a result of the first walkout, um, we, uh, the uh, headmaster knew that this was coming, um, and so he said that we weren't to do anything like have a picket line. So, so we said that wouldn't happen. That, that wasn't strictly true. Um, so, and what, what we did was we, because um, we knew people were nervous about it, what were their parents going to feel, what were the teachers going to feel, what, this, what would the consequences be? So we had a big petition, and we said we wouldn't go until 200 people signed to say they were going to go on it. If we didn't get 200, we weren't going to do it. So we got 200 just, um, and we held a picket line outside college, and we said to people, you can't go in. Uh, we marched into the centre of town. Um, some of us got arrested. I got arrested on the first walkout um, and held in a police station for about seven and a half hours. Um, and all of the school student protests, what was really interesting about it and what was such a political education was because we did a second walkout the day that war broke out. Um, and we did a big sit-in um, at one of the main junctions in Cambridge, and it was, it was my sixth form college, another massive sixth form college in Cambridge, plus n numerous secondary schools. It was even bigger than the first one. Uh, we did a big sit-in, um, and this happened, you know, in London, there were students, students ran from, literally ran all the way from Tower Hamlets to Parliament, um, they ran from North London to Parliament, it was huge, and we knew that this was going on in all these towns um, and cities, and then what happened was, again, people were arrested, and the level of violence that was meted out by the police to school students was completely incredible. That was on the first day of the war, wasn't it? On the first because day the, of the attitude war. of the police, I remember, changed completely in London as well. They thought it was like the game's up now, this is mm. serious, and you, you're going to have to go home. And they were quite aggressive, weren't they, in the streets? Yeah. yeah, these were teenagers being beaten up on the streets. I remember seeing like nose rings being pulled out of people's noses. It was really, it was really violent, and, uh, and it was uh, an important political lesson. Thanks, yeah. um, Tamsin, you, you, you're a, a climate change activist, aren't you? Yeah. What, what was your, were, were you active in the anti-war movement back in, in 2003 or w what lessons have you drawn from it and how do you relate to what you've seen in, in Amir's film today? Uh, that was the first protest that I went on um, and I didn't see myself as a particularly politically active young person um, but the betrayal and the sense of betrayal of in the kind of public institutions that we were supposed to be able to have faith in. That, I mean, we saw it in the film, it was just so palpable that this was something that I, as quite a, you know, not, not a particularly politically active person, was going to get me to go out and march. And I remember that feeling um, on the streets that day. And I was there with, like, what was I, like 20 at the time, and it was, um, before I saw myself as an activist at all. And it was, uh, you know, it, I often think of our generation of activists as 
how we've chosen to be active and you know the environmental movement is a movement of direct action and the successes that we've had um, around Heathrow, uh, around fracking have come because there's been this vanguard of people prepared to put themselves um, at personal cost in the way of the construction of things and to, to kind of give that threat. The movement that's been built has been a movement um, you know, of many things, but I also mean, of... I mean, there was an element of direct action in the anti-war movement then and subsequently, wasn't there? Were you drawing from that, or were you drawing from the fact that there was this massive march and then the war took place anyway? Did you, is that the kind of direction That's you took That's the... Yeah, I, mean, I think it was this sense that... Um, I remember when I first got active, um, and it was around the, the Heathrow question, um, and I remember being interviewed, it was on Newsnight, and I was about 22, and I'd kind of left you know, at this point, I'd seen that actually what we saw here of uh, decisions being made despite the fact that they were um, <laughs> the wrong decision to be made and there was a kind of public understanding that it was wrong. You know, the elite continues to make those decisions despite the fact that they are wrong, that they are not in the social interest, that they're not in the public's interest. Those decisions continue to be made. And, and I think out of that frustration, um, I got involved in kind of climate change activism, but I remember being asked, you know, why have you chosen to take this form of direct action? Why aren't you just part of a protest? And I said, of course we would be part of protest, but because I was part of that, I was a young person on the first political act that I made was to be part of a, you know, and I think what you said about this historical perspective that we have now, we see that actually those million people and all of those people around the world had, in a historical sense, you know, the, the fruits of that are coming and we are seeing that and you know in a way the environmental movement now with with the fact that we're using many different tactics um, in our organizing you know from from deep community embedding ourselves in communities that are on the front line of climate change to uh, being more radical in 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 threatening the industries that are going to to you know from to, to benefit or to profit from it their from their actions to the more you know mainstream public protests so i think you know we really are the children of um of tony blair's decision um and and of that million man march yeah it's a tiny thing to say that you know in the lo we, we set up a website um for the for the film um, because I was from the beginning, I was always interested in hearing what the public would would say. So, you know, share your stories. In the last two weeks, since word about the film has been getting out, a daily stream of stories being published on the site, and I, I wish I'd remembered to bring some of them, just snippets to read. But one after another says, uh, you know, I went down to London with hope in my heart, and I, when the war started. That was, it was like the greatest sort of personal catastrophe. They said, I will never believe another politician. I will never vote Labour again. I will never be, you know, it was, it was, um, it's hard to overestimate the extraordinary um, corrosive and catastrophic effect that um, denial of the people has had on public faith in, well, in fact, essentially on democracy and our politics. Ruth London, you're a fuel poverty action activist. What would you say about that? Is that your experience that, that um, Amir just mentioned? Actually, I'm really glad that it took you nine years because it's come out now. And I think we have to learn a lot about how to deal with defeat. And one of the most encouraging things that's happening now is that since the election, it could have gone two ways. You know, it could have gone, everybody's got discouraged and thought, okay, there was this massive campaign, a lot of people got politically engaged, We've lost, and the Tories have, you know, they've got a mandate. And that has absolutely not happened. You know, people have been immediately, <laughs> immediately in the streets, immediately active, immediately coming together, immediately dropping a lot of sectarianism, in fact, to come together, and undefeated. And there was another defeat, you know, speaking of the climate, you know, Copenhagen was for the climate movement the same kind of apocalyptic moment that this was for the anti-war movement, in that people went to Copenhagen from all over the world, put their bodies on the line, or more precisely, put their bodies on the freezing ground and were kept on the freezing ground there for hours by the police, um, and came away with nothing. You know, those negotiations were completely controlled by the fossil fuel industry, 
uh, and that ran the world. You know, these are the, the masters of the universe. And they intend to do the same thing in Paris this year in the climate talks there. And I think one of the things that we've all learned from experiences like this and experiences like Copenhagen is you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You can't put your faith in the big moment. You know, you have to do the on the ground organizing that means that you're strong enough when you do have a defeat, you pick yourselves up. And Fuel Poverty Action uh, is the organization that I'm most involved with now, uh, not the only one, but it's absolutely crucial that people stand by the people who are fighting the energy companies every day about their own bills. You know, sometimes we talk about the movement, we think about the organizations, but what about the movement that is not organizations? The people who are the school children, the people who are the bill payers, the people who get a prepayment meter forced on them and then can't afford to feed it and end up in the cold and the dark and everything in the fridge spoils and you can't afford to buy more. You know, that is a fight that is ongoing where people are taking on the energy companies and fuel poverty action is with them. Now, when I was asked to do this platform, um, I didn't know the film was going to be fantastic, and I thought, well, if I don't go for anything else, I'm going to go for Fuel Poverty Action. You worried action. about the film, were you? <laughs> no, it's, I, th I thought it would be good, but I didn't know it would be great, you know. But I thought, I'm going to go for Fuel Poverty Action because we desperately need people to help us carry on that fight. And at one of the, at the Brick Lane, uh, the debate organized that people probably saw about uh, a couple of days ago, somebody came up to me and said, well, fuel poverty is such an important issue that you must have millions of people working with you, so I'm going to put my energy somewhere else. And I said, no, <laughs> we really need you. We really need people who are prepared to see beyond the big moment and do the day-to-day -day work of crossing divisions between people who have a bit more money and have a bit less money, you know, racial divisions, all the divisions that we're up against, issue divisions, and come and do the work that will enable us to survive bad moments and make big victories. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's a very important point, obviously, about the big moment versus the long struggle. And, uh, and in a way, the film plays that out very effectively, I think. I'd just like to take, take the conversation a little bit on to Iraq itself and the, and the region, because, of course, I mean, there's, you were looking at it from the point of view of protest uh, in the rest of the world, and here in particular. Um, but the reality was, as you mentioned in the film, that the invasion of Iraq caused the most catastrophic consequences for the country, the mass refugees, the destruction of the infrastructure, hundreds of thousands of dead. Uh, and you know, there was massive resistance in Iraq itself, both military and in other forms. And of course, that resistance was one of the factors which led to an effective strategic defeat for the US and its allies, including Britain, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, which has really changed the global picture in many respects. But then again, now we've got a situation where, um, what, what are we, 12 years after the, uh, the invasion of Iraq, uh, that uh, British and American forces are once again in action in Iraq, and American forces in Syria, uh, and there, is, there are bombing raids taking place by British uh, aircraft over Iraq at the moment, and the country is divided in the most horrific way by sectarian violence, which was itself unleashed by the invasion, and as we all know, the, there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq in 2003, and Al-Qaeda mushroomed in Iraq after that, and is now taken the form of the even more extreme ISIS organization. So from the point of view of the film itself, Amir, I mean, did you, was that just too big a picture to get into the, the, the Iraqi reality beyond the, the, the straightforward points about the destruction that you mentioned, in the sense that there was a kind of two-headed um, relationship between protest here and in the rest of the world and the struggle in the Middle East itself? Or was there another um, idea behind your approach to that? No, I mean, in, in a sense, <clears throat> I wanted to, to, to keep it to, you know, rather than doing a kind of a vast overarching political analysis, was, sim was simply to take the central concept of the, of the film, of the story of, the, of this day, as the connecting idea, and, you know, what led to it, and what, what led from it. I think, the, I think it's a fascinating discussion about, you know, what's happening, resistance in, in, in the Middle East, you know, broadly, but 
but no, I mean, I think the, I, 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 that would have been a whole, that, that is a whole Another other film, film. Another and film. that's a whole other series, probably, yeah. really. Um, but, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, dis, it's a, it's a discussion that, that, um, that should be had. Tamsin, I know, you're, I know you've got to go early, so if, if Tamsin walks out, I think that's not, um, that's not a principled walkout, but um, what, what's your take on, on yeah. when, we, when you're looking at this and the, the experience of protest here and the horrific reality in the Middle East of, uh, that's been unleashed in the last mm. 10 years or more? When I was watching it, um, and I really like it how the last kind of quarter of the film gives that, gives that well, what happens with the momentum that this one day affected. You know, where did this spin out to? Um, and I do think, you know, that you, it needed to be just this story of protesters, of protesters all around the world and uh, sat, you know, for, for better or worse, um, in countries that are giving the violence rather than suffering from it. Um, you know, what happened to us and, and what can we learn from it? And I think, you know, it's this thing of, I. I am hopeful, it's like John le Carré said, <laughs> and I thought it was brilliant that you had him saying it because I do trust him to know these things. You know, we are going through a, a, a time when, when power relations are changing um, and when we are starting to question that, that those who say they know best do actually know best and we are starting to find new ways of resisting and I think it's really interesting what Ruth was saying about how activists have stopped kind of putting all of their you know, it's in fact, Damon Albarn said it as well. He said, you know, if we'd come back the next week, what, had, what would have happened? But we don't have the capacity to come back the next, or we didn't then have the capacity. We did. We, we did? did well, why not? <laughs> we did. Now you tell us. <laughs> we did and we didn't do it. And that really, well, no, we, did. we did, but we didn't on the scale. You, you go no, first. You say your piece and then, and then I mean, I think this is very important because the thing about the Stop the War Coalition is it wasn't just one big demonstration. Yeah. There was a very big demonstration, but then three weeks later, there was another demonstration, which was half a million people. And on the time that the war broke out, there was another demonstration that was 300,000 people. And then in the same year, when George Bush came to visit here in November, on a weekday, a working day, there was the biggest demonstration in British political history ever on a working day, which was 300,000 people. So Damon Albarn is actually wrong about that. We did come back again and again and again. And in 2006, when Israel invaded Lebanon, we had a demonstration of 150,000 at a week's notice, and that was what did for Tony Blair's premiership. On the Monday after that, six MPs wrote to him and said, be gone, give us a promise by the end of the week that you'll be gone within a year, otherwise there'll be a cabinet revolt. And he did. And then this year, we had the biggest demonstrations ever over Palestine, three in a row this summer. So, I mean, I absolutely agree with your point about we've got to be consistent, there has to be the continuation. The point, the reason actually that Stop the Wars had that effect is because it wasn't one big demonstration. It wouldn't have had that effect if it had been just one demonstration, but we did come back and back and back, and last summer we were still coming back, and if there's another conflict, we'll still be coming back. Catherine, you were, what's your take on the um, on the kind of the democratic consequences is that Tamsin was talking about about the the aftermath of the Iraq War and the things that John's just been recounting? I mean, the sense of there being a kind of democratic upheaval against the elite imposing these conflicts and and systems on the mass of the people. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right. I think that's that is the effect um, that it had. Um, it showed uh, it. It revealed so much about Parliament and about what the people that sit in Parliament um, think about democracy and think about our opinions and the contempt that they have for that. Um, and I think, actually, that demonstration clarified things for, for a lot of people. I mean, I think, in a way, when we were going on that demonstration, we didn't think that that was all that was going to be needed to stop the war. We thought there was going to have to be massive, um, you know, massive civil disobedience, people actually stopping things from happening. Before the war started, the firefighters were out on strike. And I remember people kept saying, they're having to use the troops to, to do what the firefighters will be doing. They won't be able to go to war if the firefighters are still out on strike. And unfortunately, that strike ended. And, you know, it was things like that that we were pinning our hopes on. This has got to... And we were hoping that demonstration would help mobilise um, wider layers of people. And I think that's... 
what it taught me and I think what it taught a lot of people is how does change come about in society and it's not um, through parliament, it, it's not through those people, there, there is a democratic deficit in this society, I think we're seeing it now with austerity, it's exactly the same thing, there is a tiny elite there that represent a tiny group of people and then there's all of us and I think we're going to see very similar things, I feel that in the run up to the, the demonstration we're going to have on June the 20th against austerity, you know, you can feel the momentum and it feels like the early days of of the anti-war movement, there's stalls every single weekend, there's people talking about it. That's a People's things. Assembly demonstration. Exactly, yeah. the People's Assembly demonstration on the 20th of June, um, I think has that feeling of some of those early demonstrations, because although we demonstrated after February the 15th again and again and again, there were demonstrations before that led up, and people went home and they told people, oh, you should have been there, you should have been on that demonstration, it was massive, and people thought, well, I'm not going to miss the next one, and then they told more people, and I think that's how you gather momentum, these things are very, very important in terms of mobilising people, it's never just a, a one-off, but I think it reveals to us we do have the power to change things. I mean, I remember how much the Stop the War Coalition and, and the movement encouraged people like me and, and pe people that I knew to read and, and find out about things. Um, and we were all reading the things like the, the Project for the New American Century and we were finding out about neoliberalism, what people like George Bush stood for. And there was this, you know, there was kind of this sort of sick joke going around um, just after the war was launched and people were like, oh... When are they going to go and invade Iran then? Um, and then we realized a few weeks later they weren't going to be able to do that. And I think actually we sort of underestimated really at the, at the time what that demonstration meant. It meant a stop to the project for the New American Century. It ended there and, and we did that. Yeah, just Thanks. another small, small point on, on that. As Tamsin's principal walks out. As Tamsin's principal he walks out. <laughs> yeah. is, is that it's important to remember that the vast majority of people who were on that demonstration were were first-timers. They were not seasoned protesters. They were teachers and nurses and doctors and lawyers and, you know, whatever. And they had, sorry? <laughs> no, no, people. no, no, people. They were people. They were people. They were not, you know, respectable. Nobody is disrespectable. All, everybody is respectable and they were just people. And the, the, and the fact is that um, they genuinely thought that coming out on that scale would mean something. Um, now, people say, well, you know, you can't run a country based on, you know, the size of the demonstrations. Well, you know, decision to go to war is not the same as a decision to put 10 pence on cigarettes, you know. That's the biggest, most grave decision that, uh, that a country can make. I mean, in a way, the, 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 the most shocking aspect of it is that that wasn't translated into the vote in Parliament. And I think that, well, this that, is that it. showed you what had happened to Parliament and to mainstream politics and its divorce from the population. We're seeing that uh, We're seeing it now. now. Yeah. Absolutely. I'd like to open up the discussion to... Sorry, I, just, Sorry, yeah. I, I think part of the problem in Parliament was that we weren't outside. And I'd really take your point about the civil disobedience because it's not enough to keep coming back and do another march. And in fact, a lot of people got march fatigue because we felt exciting as they were at the beginning, and that first one obviously was a tremendous high. It was not enough, and you felt you were being marched up to the top of the hill and marched down again, frankly. We should have stayed. And now people have been occupying. You know, now people would occupy. Now people will occupy. And, you know, there was a lot of us who kept a, a, a presence up in Parliament Square after that. We had a, a women's community pick, a speak out every day for months and then every week for years there and had to hold on to the right to demonstrate in Parliament Square, which the Occupy movement has now been continuing. And that process, and the, the, there's at the end of this month, there's in Didcot, there's a Reclaim the Power camp to train people up in direct action techniques because we need that. You know, going on big marches is something that like big organizations like to organize, but smaller stuff that people can do on our own maybe, is maybe there's equally a place effective. For both. Yeah. There's certainly, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, certainly a place for both. I'd like to open up the discussion to, to people who want to either ask questions or make contributions. If you keep them brief, then everyone gets a chance to say something and I'll come back to the panel. Okay, there's lots of points there. Um, so I'd like—I mean, I'm sure the panel can't deal with all of them. But um, if we start, um, if we start with Catherine, if you could basically come back on something that that's been said or, or query that's been raised, and then we'll go through the panel briefly. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I suppose I, I want to talk about um, the the role of protests and, and the role that it has in, in in changing things because I think that is the um, it is the most important thing. It's obviously what this whole film um, is about. Um, 
and I, yes, I, I mean, I totally agree. I think, um, you know, th these protests did change um, the way that people felt. I think they changed people's lives. Um, I think it did have a, a massive effect on foreign policy. I don't think we should um, swallow the idea that this protest had no effect at all. It had a, it had a massive effect on politics. I think um, w we've the mobilizations we've seen since then have been um, as a result um, of this. I, I don't think it was a moment really of pessimism. The moment of pessimism was the day that war broke out. That's, that's what I felt. And, and, it, it, and that, that disappeared because then we went and did something about it. I remember, you know, we went to college in the morning and people had been crying. And then we organized and it was like, right. Well now, and I, I, I think it, you know, the, the points that have been made about, about the current election, I think, it, you know, it is um, possible to mobilize. I think that's, th that's what it's shown. It's, you know, it's shown that, that disparity in society between what the, the politicians um, represent in, in Parliament and, and what ordinary people think and want. I think most people um, do think it's right for people to be able to uh, live in their homes and not be evicted because they've got an extra bedroom. I think most people do think it's right that there should be a decent uh, minimum wage, that people should uh, live in, in decent homes, shouldn't be dragged out of their communities, that nobody should grow up in poverty. All these things are common sense to ordinary people in society and we have to demonstrate for those things. We have to um, carry on doing that. I think the, the power of, of mobilisation is great. I think that's what we we proved then um, it was an incredibly inspiring time um, I personally didn't get demo fatigue I do remember I mean there was a point uh, it was about six months from 2002 to, to 2003 when I was just hoarse like just for six months really because there was you know there would be a demonstration locally in Cambridge and the next weekend there'd be a national demonstration and then we'd hold one in Cambridge again and then and this happened in every single town and it, it, it changed people's lives because it made us feel that we did have the power that we could change things and, and change ourselves. To see young people who, who were too young to vote, um, who were told they were apathetic, you know, all your life you're told to shut up and sit still. You're told it at school, you're told to line up, sit, you know, be quiet, shut up. You're told it at work. And people who've been told that, um, who were told their opinion didn't matter, were jumping up in the market square, making speeches for the first times in their lives, um, and having the confidence to think that what they thought mattered and they could win arguments with other people. And I think that's something that stays with you. We've bred a whole new generation uh, of people who felt that they could change the world, and that's absolutely right because we can. Thanks, Anna. John. Yeah, um, I don't think the election. I don't think the election was rigged because with a Labour Party leadership like that, you don't need to rig it, frankly. Um, and I think the, po the the signal moment that we will remember, and I say and I say this as somebody who voted Labour when the Tories won this election, is when Nicola Sturgeon said to Ed Miliband. So you'd rather have the Tories in power than have an alliance with us. And when he said yes, everybody knew that whatever else he was saying about non-don tax and all the rest of it was just inauthentic. And they lost it on that. And they lost it on one other thing, which was if somebody says to you, I hate immigrants, and your reply to them is, yeah, I half hate immigrants as well. And when the, chan the shadow chancellor is saying, I'm going to toast our election victory with a mug that's got Labour will control immigration on it, you've lost that argument to the right wing. And I think they lost it on those two, those two questions. And I think this has a permanent effect. Um, the, the, the catastrophic decline in turnout in UK general elections that followed the Iraq war has never recovered. It bumped up a couple of points in this election, but it bumped up interestingly. It was 65% in this country, it was 71% in Scotland, where there was a real anti-austerity, anti-trident voice in, in, the, in the election. And I, you know, I don't, I'm not a wholesale supporter of the SNP either, but that's the truth of those, of those statistics. Um, the only other point I want to make is this, that um, working people only really have two things. They're numbers and organization. And even the numbers aren't any good without the organization. And the way I look at success, really, in any radical campaign, well, let's just think about the word radical for a moment. What does it literally mean? Radical means its literal root is to get to the root of things. That's what radical means, to get to the root of things. And if you're on the left, ordinary people are the root of things. And if you're not getting through to ordinary people in mass numbers, whatever else you're doing or saying, you're not really radical. So I judge it like this. My sister and her husband, 
She works in a supermarket, and he is a porter in the Royal United uh, Hospital in Bath. In the last five years, they've never had a Christmas day together because their shifts never coincide. My sister has only been on two demonstrations, two national demonstrations, for the miners and on the Iraq war demonstrations. When she says, I'm not going to be looking after the kids, I'm not going to be cleaning the house, I'm not going to be taking a day off, I'm going to be getting on a coach and coming to London in order to demonstrate that's when we're really changing things. That's when we're really beginning to move. That's when you'll have something where the effect lasts for a generation or perhaps for two generations. She said to me about June the 20th, I'm going to book time off work. I'm going to get on the coach. That means we're going to start changing things now. Thanks, John. <laughs> Ruth, a brief uh, response. Here. Okay. Uh, yes, I, didn't, I obviously didn't mean that demonstrations and marches don't have a point. It's just that we need other ways of working as well, and that civil disobedience and direct action have to be part of that, and that also the way we organize has been changing. And I, I know it's, it's hard to say something controversial in a place like this, but I do think we have to learn some lessons as well from what did and didn't happen. And although many people were inspired by what stopped the war, coalition did, many people also did feel excluded by it. And when I went around talking to people in advance of this platform to find out what their experience was, I did hear from people who thought it was very top down and it wasn't until they got organizing with other people where they could have a direct input on what was going to happen that they really felt they had a political home. And I think there has been a rejection of a certain kind of politics, which is party politics, not only the Labour Party, not only Parliament, but also the left parties. I think there has been a rejection of that, and people have been finding other ways to organize and learning the lessons. And just briefly, in answer to the question about something positive to organize for, uh, I think that is absolutely crucial. Uh, I have copies of a petition here for a living wage for mothers and other carers. And that is a pro-life agenda, anti-war, you know, saying that the, the money should go, invest in caring, not killing. The money should not go to the military. It should go to people who are caring for people, and it should go to caring for the planet. That kind of vision, the vision of the Energy Bill of Rights, where we say that people have a right to energy that is both affordable and sustainable and doesn't harm either us or the planet, you know, that kind of vision, the vision of Occupy, when we said that the world's resources must go to caring for people and the planet and not to the military, corporations, or the rich. Those kinds of positive vision will help to see us through the time that we're facing now. Thanks, Ruth. Um, I'd like the last word to go to Amir, of course, because you made the film and it's, uh, and it's your achievement. Um, I mean, I, I don't know which points you want to pick up. There have been loads, but, uh, but maybe briefly if you could uh, I'll touch on draw it all together. I'll try and draw it all, I'll try and draw it all, all together. Very, very, very <coughs> uh, briefly, you, you asked about did I, was I interested in talking to, to pro-war commentators or those trolls on the right like Pipes, and we have them here as well, you know, Nick Cohen and Aronovich and so on. No, um, basically. Um, um, uh, the numbers point is very, very interesting. I mean, I always say that for every one person that came on the demonstration, uh, there would be at least, you know, at a minimum, a couple of people, two or three other people who shared their views. So I think what that day represented was a much, much bigger uh, feeling in the country than, 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 than is, even, is even reported. Um, sequel, what a question to ask me. <laughs> I, um, I do have some ideas. I probably can't talk about them um, right now, but I probably should do something light before I do something... Something uh, jokey. Something jokey, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe democracy. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> no. Um, it, is it... Uh, was it... Oh, he went. Was it rigged? Um, uh, who knows? Um, but um, the... And, you know, and somebody said about, you know, oh, he's talking about violence. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. There was something in the paper today that talks about academic research that shows, you know, uh, you know what kind of demonstrations have, you know, have an, have an impact. And of course, you know, violence, I don't advocate violence, but violence sometimes does, does have an impact. It's interesting that in Egypt, 
you know, where after 40 years of dictatorship, they reached the point where there was, you know, they said to me, you know, one of them said to me in the, in the film, it's not in the film, but he said, you know, I, I went out one day and I kissed my wife goodbye because I didn't actually think I'll, there was a chance I might come back that night. So the, there was a point where people thought, they, you know, it's so bad, we've got nothing else, nothing to lose. So we're going to go and sit there in Tahrir for 18 days until something changes. They even had a, in, I don't know the Arabic, but it, it's like, um, it means we're, we're not going, he has to go. Um, you know, the question is, our societies are different. If, you know, are we in a position uh, in, in our evolution where we are, we are going to do the kind of things that, that you know, li like an occupation? I don't know, maybe, maybe that, that, will, that will come one day. I just want to say a few words about other consequences. You know, now, the, the, the fact that that vote for war in 2003, you know, went forth, but the fact is there was a vote and now it's actually accepted that a prime minister can't go to war without taking it to a vote. Um, it's now almost sort of become you know, a, a de facto position, and, and that's, that's important. Um, so overall, I think what I want to say is that you know, we fe it, it feels like we're living at a time where we're trying to work out our relationship. It's clearly, the system, in however way one describes it, isn't working. We're trying to work out our relationship as citizens to our, uh, to our governments. What shape and form that will take is, you know, I guess, you know, um, to be worked out. I did read something yes, two days ago. Paul Krugman wrote in the New York Times, I think a piece was called Fighting for History. And what was fascinating about this was that it showed the approval rating for George Bush went up. It was 35% in 2006. In 2013, it was 49%. His approval rating went up 14% in, in, in those years. And the point he made was you cannot Basically, this is an ongoing battle. And he said, you cannot leave the writing of history to your enemies or, or opponents or however you want to, to put it. But that's important. I, I'm not saying, it made me think, you know, is this fighting for history that actually it's telling a narrative that if it wasn't told, the, 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 what remains is the narrative that we were left with in the mainstream media, which is, it doesn't work, go home. Um, and I, and I hope that that's, I hope people, you know, will see it and change their minds. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amir. I, I mean, that last, that last point about, uh, about keep keeping control of history is, I think, a very important one. I and mean, we've seen in the last few days how some of the same people who supported this original war in the Labour Party not only Tony Blair, but some of his closest supporters are back in action after the defeat of Ed Miliband uh, last week and, you know, quite openly making the case for the same kind of politics that led to this in the first place. So I think that's a very important point to keep control and to keep uh, discussion about these things because it affects the now, not just what we think about the past. So anyway, thanks to Amir. Uh, it was a fantastic experience to see the film. Thanks for all your hard work. Thanks to the panel, to uh, Catherine... Um, John and Ruth, and also Tamsin, who left earlier. And thanks to all of you for coming to this uh, screening and this discussion. As for the movie, I, I should confess, I, I, I'm not a big fan of that particular one. Uh, because if I have to sum up my personal emotions in one phrase, well, life sucks in Ukraine, and then you die.